This Week at Liberty. Today, Pastor Matt continues our summer sermon series, When Dreams Face Reality. Please pray for our kids as they travel tomorrow for junior camp. Parents and teens, don't forget to mark your calendar for UTC, Ultimate Teen Challenge, on August 19. This month, we will have guest speakers each Wednesday for a month-long Bible conference. Plan to be here. Join us on August 6 for Family Soul Winning and Liberty Essentials. We will provide free, delicious breakfast before we head out into the community, inviting people to church. If you are a guest with us, we would love to connect with you. Please fill out a connection card in the seat in front of you and drop it in during the offering. Thank you for joining us today at Liberty Baptist Church. things that we'd like to share with you this morning. We're going to welcome you to Liberty Baptist Church. So glad that you're a part of our services this morning. Uh, this Today's message is going to be, you're going to enjoy today's message um, as is the second part of our um, seeing dreams, making or facing realities. Um, and it's going to be through in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter uh, 38 is where we're going to be at this morning. You're going to enjoy this morning's message. I want to challenge you, encourage you, I should say, if uh, maybe there's a prayer request that we can pray for you over the course of this week, take out that uh, connection card as we're uh, in place in your Bible at, towards the end of the service. Fill that connection card out. Maybe there's a way that we can pray with you, as I mentioned just a second ago. 
or maybe we can praise God with you for what an amazing God he truly is. Maybe he's done something in your life that you'd like to share with us each and every Thursday back over here on this wing. We pray for each and every request, and we're so thankful to be able to do that with you. Um, on the back side of that, uh, on the back side of that connection card, um, there's a spot for my next steps. Maybe it's baptism, discipleship, Liberty Essentials. We have our connection classes, our Liberty Essentials class, rather, the gateway to membership. That'll be August 6th. Uh, but we have one for recognition this morning. I think I saw Jennifer. Jennifer LaRocca finished uh, discipleship. I think she was back over here. Uh, can, do we have her here? We'd love to welcome her and uh, thank her for her great job. We'll make sure that she gets that this afternoon. Thank you so much. Let's pray. And as we finish, uh, as we finish praying this morning, we will uh, continue in our worship this morning. Lord, we thank you, God, for being so good and gracious to us this morning. We pray, God, that your name would be exalted. We pray that your name would be uplifted. God, we want to see you work in our lives. Lord, our world is hurting. Lord, many times we go through hurt and experience pain ourselves. And God, I pray through this message this morning. I pray, God, that you would encourage each and every one of us. Lord, encourage us to the point that we may be able to help others this week. Lord, that we minister to, that we work with, that we live beside. God, everything that we do, we want to bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that your name would be blessed this morning. God, we want to exalt your name and glorify your name together. Lord, I pray that you would minister to our spirit, both in preaching and in song together. And I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together as we sing, Blessed Be the Name this morning.
out our singing this morning with one of our favorite old hymns, I Love You, Lord. Great singing this morning. You can be seated. Good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Genesis, chapter 39, is where we're going to start today as we continue a series we started last week entitled When Dreams Face Reality. Today we're looking at part number two, and today we're going to look at the dreamer who becomes the accused in Genesis chapter 39 and verse number two. If you weren't with us last week, you can catch up with us. You can go to experienceliberty.com and see all of the past sermons from uh, this series and other series that we've gone through. I hope that'll be an encouragement to you. But just to get us caught up to where we are in relationship to our scripture passage today, we talked about a man by the name of Joseph. When we're introduced to him, he's 17 years old and God has given him a vision. He gives him a dream. This dream is somewhat unusual. The dream is about him harvesting some wheat or some bushels. And when he harvests, the, harvests these wheat and these bushels together, his 11 brothers who are also harvesting wheat and bushels, they, are, they, they gather theirs together. But his bushel stands upright and all of his brothers, their bushels bow down to his. When he reveals that dream to his brothers, do you think his brothers are having a good feelings about that? No way, Jose. 42 years ago today, my brother was born. And he's always going to be my little brother. Doesn't matter where we go, what we do, he's always gonna be my little brother. And sometimes older brothers, they get annoyed by their little brothers. If you know what I'm talking about, say yes. yes. If you didn't say yes, it's because you're the little brother. <laughs> so, so here's a little brother, and the little brother is saying, hey guys, and he's talking to his older brothers who are in their 20s, uh, 30s, perhaps even their early 40s, and he's saying, someday God's told me you're all going to bow down to me. <laughs> what do you think about that? I'll tell you what I think about that. He has a second dream, and in that second dream, as a star... The Bible tells us that the other stars bow down to him, but this one's a little bit different. The sun and the moon bow down to him as well. His dad, when he hears that, corrects him and says, you think that that's gonna happen, like your mom and I are gonna bow down to you? Dad, it's just the dream that God gave me. The Bible tells us that Jacob, his father, observed that saying and, and almost pondered it for a few minutes. That's interesting. God gave you this dream. What in the world does that mean? Because of the jealousy of the brothers, they become so enraged 
The father had shown him favor. Their jealousy was enraged because he's got these dreams and he had tattletold on them in the past. So he narked them out. And so they're upset with him, upset with him. And on this day, when they are caught doing something they're not supposed to do, the Bible tells us that they devise a plan to kill Joseph. They decide rather than killing Joseph, they would sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites on their way down to Egypt. And they lie to the dad. They take his coat of many colors off and they lie to the dad as they dip it in animal's blood and say, we think he's dead. We, what do you think? And the dad, Jacob, he mourns for many days considering the fact that his favored son, Joseph, is now gone. It's a sad, tragic event. And when we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 39, we see a young man who's bound as a slave and he's going into a place that he's never been before. It's completely foreign to him. As a slave, he has to travel through the sands and the deserts of the Middle East to where he would get to Egypt. And Egypt was unlike any place he'd ever experienced before. The Nile River brought great life to that desert region. And the culture of Egypt was unlike anything he had ever known before. Growing up in his home, Jacob had served the one true God. He had interacted with God, so much so that God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And Israel would speak about his father's interactions with the one true God and his grandfather's interactions with the one true God. And Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And for his 17 years growing up inside of Jacob's home, he was instructed on the sacrifices to God, obedience to God, the way that a man should live in the dictates of God's law and God's word and observing what was truth and living in a way that would honor the one true Lord. But now in Egypt, he's confronted with a, a multiplicity of gods. Oh, in Egypt, they worship the God of the sun, Ra. They worship Osiris. They worship the God of the river. They worship the God of the frogs. They worship the God of night, the God of day, the God of dark. The, they worship, there's just a multiplicity of gods. And Joseph is confronted with a brand new culture. Not only that, but the environment of Egypt is starting to change around this time. It is becoming a superpower in the world. The regional tribalism of the nation was starting to be dissolved. And at this time, the tribe of Egypt or the nation of Egypt is ascending into prominence. The conflict with the Hyksos is favoring the Egyptians at this time. And so a burgeoning military power is being developed in Egypt and their king, their leader, would be known as Pharaoh. This is the environment that Genesis chapter 39 opens up with. If you're with me this morning, say yes. yes. Genesis chapter 39 and verse number one, the Bible says, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him from the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And verse number two, the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man and he did, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. We see number one, life in Egypt begins. Now you could go through all of the circumstances and try to figure out why did this happen? Why is Joseph in slavery? But it all comes down to something that we all understand that we live in a corrupt world. The corrupt brothers of Joseph had sold him out. And from time to time in life, we look at the situations that are present and we just look and say, this place is messed up. On a macro level, the world is broken, isn't it? When you look at problems, when you saw the, the fighting in Uvalde, the shooting a few weeks ago in that Texas town, your heart just breaks when you see those circumstances. And when you look at the war in Ukraine and you see things going on, oh, your heart breaks over circumstances. When you go to the gas station, you're just like, what in the world's going on here? Why are we paying $5 a gallon? Because there are big problems that we face, but then we get ourselves away from those big problems and we're all dealing with issues. We're dealing with budget needs. We're dealing with family issues. We're dealing with health problems. 
We're dealing with relationship issues. People who are going through difficult times and divorce and separation and death and health issues. We have personal issues. And then, in spite of those personal issues, there's things that are private. And we understand that one of the biggest problems of our lives is ourselves. You ever disappointed yourself? How many of you made a mistake this week? Yeah, look at that. You are not alone. You are in the company of broken people. We are all messed up. And there could be circumstances for Joseph to say, look at, uh, I'm here and I'm going to be upset. I'm gonna be mad. I'm gonna be angry because why? All those brothers did this to me. But the Bible gives us an interesting word in verse number two. The Bible says this in verse number two, that the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. That word prosperous is not an indication of his fortune because Joseph wasn't lucky. He was a slave. It's not like, well, that was a good twist of fate, wasn't it? He wasn't lucky. He didn't just have favor shining upon him. The word prosperous is a word that denotes his character. The word prosperous indicates a, a person. Imagine if you will, you like uh, cage fighting or you like boxing or you enjoy wrestling and here's a guy and he just gets hit. Poof. And when he gets hit, he's laying there on the mat and everyone's thinking he's done. And this guy named Rocky Balboa, <laughs> and he faces the Russians eyeball to eyeball again. That's the word prosperous. The word prosperous is he just keeps going. He keeps pushing forward is the literal sense of the word. He's a prosperous man, not because he was lucky, not because he had good fortune. It was a character trait of Joseph that he just kept moving forward. And when it seems like you've been knocked out, you see Joseph. I could do this all day. He's a prosperous man in spite of a corrupt brotherhood. We notice this. Not only does he deal with that, but we see the collateral blessing of God. In verse number three, the Bible says, and his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. When I was about 13 years old, the Persian Gulf War started in the Middle East. And I remember watching, and it seemed like it was in real time, in 1990 and 1991, as Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield took place, where we would watch for the first time on CNN laser-guided missiles that I remember, hitting a target and blowing up that target. And I remember hearing for the first time this phrase, collateral damage. And Bernard Shaw, the news anchor, said phrases like this, these weapons of war allow the U.S. to minimize collateral damage. Previous to that, when we went to war, if we dropped a bomb, it just blew up everything. I mean, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, you drop those bombs, poof, it didn't matter if you were fishing that day, it didn't matter if you were at school that day, it didn't matter if you were going to work, poof, it just blew up everything. And though you were not the intended target because the bomb hit, it created collateral damage. If you understand what I'm talking about, say yes. The Bible indicates here that there is a thing for those who know Christ as their savior, called collateral blessing. In verse number three, it's not a Bible term, but notice the phraseology here. The master saw, the master Potiphar, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, Joseph, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. There is a principle in scripture that whenever I do right or you do right as a believer, we find the blessing of God in our life. And those who, who are around a believer who is doing right receive the collateral blessing of Christians living 
in obedience to his word. Potiphar recognizes that. And though he doesn't necessarily believe in the Lord, and though he probably has his own plethora of gods to which he does obeisance on a regular basis, he sees something unique in Joseph. And the thing that he sees is that he is prospered. And so he elevates him. I think it's fascinating in verse number three, he doesn't just mention God, the generic God, the man upstairs, the person who is the boss, the great overseer. No, he talks about the specific name of God. May it not be lost upon us that there is power in the name of God. And the name of God is Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter five, the Bible says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and in my spirit with the what? Power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come from a religious society. Rappers, basketball players, movie stars, politician, we will say things like, God bless America. And I appreciate that. But when we speak about our God, may it not be lost upon us that we do not serve a generic God. We serve the one true God of the universe and his name is Jesus Christ. May there never be confusion that we don't worship the same God of the Egyptians. We don't worship the same God of the Italians. We don't worship the same God of the world. Our God's name is Jesus Christ because in the name of Jesus, there is power. Why is it that whenever people use profanity of a deity, they never say, Hare Krishna? How come they never say that? How come they never say, Allah? Why is it the name of Jesus Christ is blasphemed? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. There is a true deity. His name is Jesus Christ. And may we lean into the power of Jesus. May we know the name of of our God, because in the name of our God, there is power. He brings blessing, and in that blessing, notice where that blessing comes in verse number four. And Joseph found grace in his sight, Potiphar's sight, and he served him and made him overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, Potiphar. Everything in his portfolio, his agricultural holdings are up. His uh, 401k is up. His uh, Bitcoin is even up. Everything is up because of Joseph's interaction as the portfolio manager of Pharaoh, uh, of Potiphar. Verse six, and the Bible says, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He knew not aught he had. Joseph, whenever he went to dinner, he would give their card. He knew that there was enough money in there. Whenever Joseph got on Amazon Prime, he was just clicking away. No big deal. The packages will be delivered because the money's in the bank. Joseph took care of it. Probably didn't use Amazon Prime. It was probably Nile Prime. <laughs> it's, a, it's an early Egyptian iteration of the, of the popular verse number. I just thought of that. Just right now, I just thought of that. I didn't even... I didn't use that in the first service. That's, that's unique to you. But I can guarantee you I'll say it in the next service. <laughs> the Bible says in verse number uh, seven, he, he left every single thing in his hand. Verse number six, and Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. We notice this, that in spite of a corrupt brotherhood, collateral blessing, there is character building, in hap there is character building happening in Joseph's life. In 1990, during the first Gulf War, many of us were introduced to this man, Colin Powell. A patriot, man who served this country, did amazing things, served as the Joint Chiefs of Staff for all of the United States military, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the uh, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Army, and the Coast Guard. They all reported to General Colin Powell. He was in charge of all of those things. And he was a brilliant man, a smart man. Strategi uh, st he was a strategist, uh, according to President Bush. He was a person of very well renown. At his death, Colin Powell was said to be worth $60 million. Now, when he died, 
I would imagine, or, or near the end of his death, I would imagine that Colin Powell is not overseeing every single one of the aspects of his holdings. He more than likely had a person who helped invest. He more than likely had a person who oversaw his affairs so that when he was looking at his life ending, there was a person who took care and made sure that his descendants and his income and his investments went where they were supposed to be, okay? Potiphar is a man who is on par with General Colin Powell. And his right-hand man is this guy named Joseph. Joseph is sitting in on meetings about military strategy that he would have never learned in a field tending sheep. Joseph is learning about commerce. He's learning about trade. He's learning about international affairs. As this country is growing into military might, he's learning about cultures. He's learning about mining. He's learning about architecture and construction all during this time. And what you see in the life of Joseph is that in spite of the fact that he is in slavery and in, fight, in spite of the fact that he's had to deal with some very difficult circumstances, you see this thread of truth that Joseph is being exposed to things that he never would have been exposed to as the 11th son of Jacob on a shepherd's field in Canaan. Were they challenging? Yes. Was it difficult? Sure. Would he have chosen to be sold as a slave? No, but he was a prosperous man. He was a person who just got right back up and said, okay, what's next? Life in Egypt was challenging, but you start to see the glimmer of God's blessing. But the dream for Joseph's life was never to have the life of a lead slave. Let me say that again. The dream that God gave Joseph was not that someday he would be in charge of a general's house or the caretaker of another group of slaves. That was not the dream that God had given to Joseph. But God is working that dream to become a reality. Tragedy strikes as life in Egypt turns to lust in Egypt. This man who takes care of affairs, demonstrates great wisdom, shows wonderful promise and opportunity, catches the eye of the mistress of the house. Potiphar's wife turns her gaze upon Joseph and verse number seven begins a very sordid tale. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, who's never named in scripture, just denoted as the master's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. He refused. And he said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. My master doesn't even know everything that's going on and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. There's none greater in his house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God and it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. He's doing work and for some reason all the other servants had been dismissed, been given the day off. There was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his coat or his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. The Bible tells us that lust starts to arise in this woman's life. And in doing so, she keeps pressing him to just say yes. Just say yes. Just say yes. Just say yes. Now, I don't know what movies or pictures or ideas you've seen of Joseph or Potiphar's wife uh, before growing up, I was always told that Potiphar's wife was disgusting, you know, sloppy. What kind of woman would do this? And it's always pictured, you know, Potiphar's wife has one of these three characteristics. Like oh, there's, <laughs> there's Potiphar's wife right there, and uh, yeah, you don't, you want nothing to do with Potiphar's wife. Uh, 
by the way, <laughs> word of note, don't wear purple and black together. It paints a bad <laughs> picture. But Potiphar's wife was probably not some ugly, disgusting person. She had the wealth of Egypt at her beck and call. She had every opportunity for uh, any cosmetological type of thing that was available. She was probably a very beautiful woman. Because whenever sin comes in, it doesn't describe or disguise itself as something that is averse and disgusting. The very first sin that happened in the world. Let's read what the Bible says about the first sin that happens in the world. In Genesis chapter three and verse number six, the Bible says, and when the woman saw that the tree was bad for food and that it was disgusting to the eyes and a tree to be undesirable, to make one stupid, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and did eat. Is that what the scripture says, yes or no? Do you notice all the adjectives that are described about sin? The very first sin. The woman saw that the tree was what? Good. It's good. What had God used about the word good in the past? All of creation was good. And now this must be good. And a tree that was pleasant to the eyes. I like looking at that. that that's something worthwhile something to be desired of, and you'll be smarter. It will help open up your mind to these new experiences and new opportunities. You'll be wise if you do that. Sin always comes across as this wonderful opportunity. It paints itself not as a disgusting octopus, but as something that is desirable. And the constant drumbeat says yes. And Joseph has opportunity to sin. There's an attractive availability and the boy's lonely. He's probably in his early 20s at this time and has never been with a woman. And there's nobody who's going to know. There's an attractive opportunity and he's lonely. I, I was trying to remember where I read this, but I was reading a book about how Satan engages us with sin. And the author, and forgive me for not being able to find who it was, the author said that there are triggers to sin in our life that oftentimes come. And when we see those triggers, we must, we must halt, H-A-L-T, H-A-L-T, excuse me. We must halt. And he said, because sin comes when there's a trigger where we are hungry, where we are angry, where we are lonely, or we are tired, H-A-L-T. Thought, man, that's really good. We sin when we're hungry, when we're angry, when we're lonely, when we're tired. Sin has the ability to come in and wreak havoc with our life. And Joseph has every single one of those. He's hungry. He's a 20-year-old guy who wouldn't want to be with a woman. He's angry. Do you think there's opportunity for him to be angry? His brother sold him to slavery. You could find cause for anger in that. He's lonely. Nobody here understands him. He's now the boss, so even the other slaves look at him sideways. His, his boss, he's kind to him, he's enjoying him, but he understands he's just being used and here's somebody who's willing to comfort him and he's tired. And with all of these triggers going off at the same time in his life, there's a constant desire to just say yes. But Joseph refuses. Three reasons why Joseph refuses. He just says no. Look at the three reasons. Number one, he gives in verse number, verse number nine, excuse me, verse number eight, he says, behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all into my hand. No, I can't do this. Why? Because number one, because of my master. Because of these relationships that I'm with now, it will affect those relationships. Lady, I can't do this. 
because it would affect my relationships with my master. He's given me a job, he's elevated me. I have a nice room, I have good opportunities. Moving forward, this is a wonderful opportunity for me and I'm not gonna mess up that opportunity and I'm not gonna violate this relationship. Number two, I believe he draws upon his past experience in saying no. Look at verse number nine. Then there is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. He understands the great sin of being with another man's wife. The Bible tells us in a very small glimpse into the dysfunctional family of Joseph's life that it came to pass when Israel dwelt in the land that Reuben, this is Joseph's older, oldest brother and Israel, his dad, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. In one of the most sordid stories of the Old Testament, Reuben, the oldest son of Israel, when he comes of age, has relationships with his father's concubine, whose name is Bilhah. There was great tragedy in Joseph's life. When Joseph was somewhere between the ages of six and 12 years old, his mom died. Joseph's mom, Rachel, passed away. She died in childbirth to his younger brother named Benjamin. His mom had a handmaid whose name was Bilhah. And as the custom would have been, the person who from the time of Joseph being six to eight or 10 years old, it's, it's somewhat subjective in scripture, from the time that Joseph is just still a young boy, his stepmom, his caretaker, the person who would oversee his nurturing, his education, his development, his wardrobe, all of those things would have been his mom's handmaid, Bilhah. And there was a great tragedy that happened sometime in this scope of his life where Bilhah, and his oldest brother were together. And it rocked the family so deeply that Reuben lost all credibility, that the inheritance would be passed down and great shame was brought upon Jacob. If you'll remember the graph that we showed you last week, Jacob had four, family, uh, had four wives and with those four wives, he would have 12 sons and at least one daughter. When Rachel passed away, Bilhah would have become his overseer, his guide, his, his mother. And Reuben and Bilhah had relationships together. And it's no wonder that when you read verse number nine, that he says, because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness? Now catch the lesson here. Many people in this room today have gone through tremendous tragedy, sorrow, divorce, abuse, abandonment. And in each one of those challenges, there has been a necessary place of God's grace to overcome that. But those challenges can create in your life a character and an abhorrence for sin to say, I'm never gonna do that. I'm never going to do that. I have seen the effects and I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to do that. I'll never forget a young girl whose mom and dad went through divorce and she was about 13 years old as they were going through divorce and every single summer she would come to summer camp until the time she was 17 years old and she would make a decision every single summer at summer camp and with tears in her eyes she would say to my wife and I, she would say, I made a decision today again never to have a divorce because the impacts of that broken relationship struck her so deeply that she said, I'm never gonna allow that to happen in my life again. I'm never gonna move forward with it again. One of the impetuses for Joseph to have so much resolve is that he saw the hurt, the pain, the anger, the failure inside of his own family. And as Potiphar's wife is saying, hey, baby, he's saying, no, 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 no. 
I remember what that was like. My junior high Sunday school teacher said that a wise man learns from the mistakes of others, but a fool learns from his own mistakes. And Joseph demonstrates great clarity and great wisdom here and that he learns from the mistakes of others. And when the opportunity arises for him to commit the same transgression that brought so much turmoil into his family's life, he refuses. No, I can't because of my master. No, I can't because of my mother. Number three, I can't, and this is the best reason of all, I can't because of my maker. Because thou art his wife, verse nine, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against who? Sin against who? It would be a sin against Potiphar. It would be a sin against the heritage and the calling that I had growing up. But the greatest violation, the greatest sin would be against Almighty God. Why? Because God sees everything. And God knows everything. And God is with me. And I would rather, I would rather offend you, ma'am, than offend God. I would rather violate you than violate God. Because his favor is more important to me than your favor. And his blessing is more important to me than your blessing. And I would much rather be accepted with God Almighty than the wife of Potiphar. I'm just going to say no, but notice this. It doesn't stop. The Bible tells us in verse number 10, and it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph, how long? Day by day. day. It just won't stop. It just keeps going and going and going. This is somewhat encouraging for those of us who are alive. That there never comes a place in life where we're like, oh, I have no problems. Oh, I have no problems. I'm good. No, every single person deals with struggles. And those struggles are often day in and day out and day in and day out and day in and day out. And those problems become so great for Joseph here that it's time for him to create a separation. All the other servants leave for the day. And as the servants leave for the day, he finds himself and it's lonely. There's nobody. Where is everybody? And Potiphar's wife comes out to seduce Joseph. She grabs him. She's very lusty towards him. And in a way to escape, he, he, he rips himself away, leaving his coat in the arms of Pharaoh's wife. It's the second time that Joseph has gotten himself in trouble with a coat. Joseph, go to sweaters or, you know, a V-neck, do something there. <laughs> the coats aren't a good, they're not a good look for you, bro. Verse number 13, and it came to pass when he saw that he had left his garment in her hand and, she, uh, and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, seeing she hath brought an Hebrew, seeing he hath brought an Hebrew unto us to mock us. Verse number 14 is so telling about the marriage of Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. We see that there is great discord, so much so that she has the liberty to badmouth her husband behind his back. Now, obviously, he's no gem of a guy. He's absent so much that. She's willing to have her way with a servant. So we have a very dysfunctional marriage. And by the way, Joseph can't correct their dysfunctional marriage. Only the married couple can correct their dysfunctional marriage. So she is bad-mouthing. Look, 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 look. He brought this Hebrew in. Who brought this Hebrew in? Potiphar. The Bible tells us in verse number 14, see then that he hath brought an Hebrew into us to mock us and came unto me to lie with me. And I cried with a loud voice, help. And I came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got out. And she said unto, uh, and she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came in. Potiphar comes home for the day. And she spake unto him according to these words. The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me 
to mock me. He wanted to violate me. He wanted to have his way with me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and he fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard, his water, heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, after the manner did thy servant unto me, that his wrath was kindled. Now what verse number 19 is so interesting is that Potiphar, he is upset, but it doesn't say that he's necessarily upset with Joseph. Now he could be, but you can read almost between the lines that he's like, oh my goodness, what have you done now? And he's angry because, uh, and the reason you can feel that maybe he's not as, he's not agreeing with his wife as much as he understands his wife's character and he's more zealous of Joseph because Joseph, his 401k, all of his stocks, all of his properties, everything's going up. Why would I go with this woman who she's just draining everything? Why would, and his, his inappropriate behavior as a husband, his inattentiveness as a husband, looking at this woman and this woman who's obviously clamoring for relationship and for love, this dysfunctional marriage, he's ticked off. The Bible says he's very angry. And in his anger, the Bible tells us, what would you do to a slave? Excuse it, but slaves were cattle. They were property to be bought and sold at this time. So a slave comes in and tries to violate your wife, have him executed. But notice where he goes in verse number 20. And Joseph's masters took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. You understand, don't you, that there are different types of prisons? There's solitary confinement, there's places with hard labor, and then there's a place where white collar prisoners go where they have cable TV and a nice library. That's the prison that Joseph goes to. Joseph goes to the king's prison. He's not going to that bad place pit over there. He's going to the king's prison. Now it's still prison, but we see a man who's lost in Egypt. Verse number 21. And even while he, the Bible tells us he's in the king's prison and there was bound in the prison, verse 21, and the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph into his hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. He became the prisoner boss. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer over it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. The keeper of the prisoner doesn't even know what's going on. The guard, the warden, if you will. The Bible says the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Even in prison where he feels like he is lost, his character demonstrates again, I'm a, pris I'm a prosperous man. It's time to go do my work. This is where I am. I'm not gonna stay on the mat. This is where I am. I'm gonna keep moving forward. And even in prison, the presence of God is demonstrated. But don't we notice this? Do you see the pattern starting to grow? What's the pattern of Joseph's life? As a young man, we see a pattern. He's gonna be faithful and he's gonna work for his dad regardless of what his brothers are doing. In Potiphar's house, we see a, a, a mature man taking care of all of Potiphar's business. And now he's in prison because the same person he was back in a shepherd's field in Potiphar's house is the same person he is in prison. His character remains steady and he has a God who's overlooking a shepherd's son, Potiphar's right-hand man, and now the lead prisoner because he maintains a constant character and God blesses his consistency. God rewards, God allows him to prosper, but he's in prison. Now remember this, the dream that God gave him was not someday that he would be the lead 
of all the slaves of a general in Egypt. That wasn't the dream that God had given him. And notice this, God didn't give him a dream to be the head of all the prisoners in a prison either. God had given him a dream and right now he's just facing reality. Will that dream come to fruition? Well, the constant God who was with him in a shepherd's field in Potiphar's house and now prison will be with him in the future. His character must maintain and if his character maintains and he continues to give allegiance to the Lord, that dream will become a reality. But right now, the reality is he's in a prison. And maybe that's where you are today. Maybe the circumstances of your life aren't great, aren't wonderful, aren't the dream you thought they were going to be. Maybe you're just dealing with reality. And the challenge to you is this, to keep being a prosperous person. Keep doing what you know is right to do. Don't give up. Circumstances change, but don't let your character change. Keep doing right. And as you keep doing right, remember that God sees all. God sees all. And the dream that God is giving you, the vision of God using your life for his glory is still able to be realized even though the reality might seem obscure. When dreams face reality, Joseph was never called to be the leader of the slaves. He was never called to be the leader in a prison. God has a higher calling for him. But right now, that dream's facing reality. And maybe yours is too. Don't give up. Don't give in. Allow your character to demonstrate the goodness of God. Father, I thank you for your word and the truth that's found in it. Pray that you'd help us to apply it to our lives and use it for your glory. And I ask this in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, nobody's looking around. I wanna ask you this question. If you were to die today, do you know with certainty that you'd be on your way to heaven. You know for sure you're going to heaven. If that's you, would you say, yes, Pastor Matt, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. Would you show me your hand? Would you put it up? Thank you. And then put it down. Maybe you're here. And if you're being honest, you don't know with certainty that you're on your way to heaven. You recognize, like we all do, that we're sinners. And in our sin, we'll never be good enough to get to heaven. That's why Jesus had to die be buried and rise again to pay for our sins. And so maybe that truth has taken hold of your life today. You know that because you're a sinner, somebody had to pay for your sin and you pay for it, you go to hell. But Jesus, God in human flesh, died on a cross to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again. He offers salvation free of charge to anyone who will put their faith and trust in him. And if you don't know for certain you're going to heaven, you can call upon Jesus and ask him to save you of your sins and take you to heaven when you die, and he will. Would you whisper this prayer to Jesus right where you're seated? Just say this, dear Lord Jesus, I believe the Bible's true. I know you are God. I know I'm a sinner. And I deserve hell for my sin. But I believe you died for me. You were buried and rose from the dead to pay for my sin. And in the best way I know how, I ask you to save me. Please forgive me of my sin and take me to heaven when I die. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Help me to live for you. If you just prayed that prayer, I would love to encourage you in your walk with God. I'd like to pray for you that God would continue to work in your life. If you're with me this morning, you said, Pastor Matt, I just prayed that prayer for the first time. I prayed to receive Christ as my savior. Would you slip your hand up so I could see that? Thank you, just slip it up and then put it down. I celebrate that decision with you. We want to nurture what God's doing in your life. Christian, have you allowed the circumstances, the reality of this world to dim the dream that God's placed into your life? Have you allowed sin to reproach and creep in and break down that which God wants for your life? Have you allowed 
Satan to dilute your vision and say, yeah, God doesn't care. Maybe this morning you've been reminded that there is a God who cares and that God wants you to live in relationship to his word. Just right where you're seated. Would you do business with God? If God spoke to you this morning, would you slip up your hand so I could see that and say, Pastor Matt, God spoke to me this morning. Just right where you're seated. Would you take a few minutes and just, just let the Lord know? Lord, I've allowed my choices to not be in line with your word. Lord, I need to refocus my attention on who you are. The fact that you see and know all things. If God spoke to you this morning, just where you're seated, would you spend some time with him? We thank you, Lord, for the inspiration of your word and how it shows us what you want us to do, how we should live, and I thank you for the life of Joseph. I pray that we would be challenged to live in light of the truth that we've learned today and use it for your glory. For those who prayed to receive you as their savior, Father, give them the confidence that heaven is their home, and Father, may they make the steps uh, that you want in their life to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I ask this in your name, amen. In just a moment, we're gonna receive this morning's offering. When we do, I hope that your card will be filled out and put inside of there so that we can connect with you and pray with you. In the chair in front of you, every single person should have one of these cards in, in their hand. So take it out from the chair in front of you right now and you can fill it out completely. On the back, there's a place for us to uh, hear about what God did in your life today. Perhaps there was a decision you made or a prayer request that you'd like to share with us. Would you fill that out completely? And then drop it in the offering plate, whether you're a member, whether you're a guest. We want to connect with you today. And in just a moment, we'll receive our morning offering. Would you fill out one of those cards? And then drop it in the offering plate as it goes by. My wife, Brianna, and I are going to our community room, which is through that door and to the left. And if you're a guest with us today, or maybe it's your first time in a long time, we'd sure love to connect with you before you leave. Would you stop by and see us? We have some refreshments available back there. We would just like to get to know you before you leave today because we're sure glad that you chose to spend your morning with us here at Liberty Baptist Church. Pastor Ruiz is gonna come and share with us a few closing thoughts. We'll take this uh, morning's offering and I hope you'll stop by and see us before you leave. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Uh, this is the time when I ask you to get your bulletins and uh, we're gonna go over some information that it's, uh, that's very pertinent to this week's events. So make sure that you have it with you and take a look at this. We have our final uh, service on uh, July Bible Conference this coming Wednesday at 6.30. So we'd like for you to be here at 6.30 and, uh, and enjoy the preaching of Ryan Thompson. Expect the Lord to speak to your heart this coming Wednesday. So be here at 6.30. Also, we'd like for you to partner with us as we pray for, our, for your youth, uh, uh, the children that will be going to the junior camp this uh, tomorrow. As a matter of fact, they will be leaving tomorrow uh, at 11.30 or so. So make sure that you pray for them. Uh, the Lord may speak to their hearts and make their uh, life-changing decisions on their young uh, lives. So let's pray for them. Also, if you have your youth here with us, you want to make sure you take note of this. The youth, uh, Ultimate Teen Challenge, or UTC, is coming up on Friday, August 19th. So make sure you speak to Brother Haverson for more information. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. You may already uh, have breakfast this morning, and you're probably maybe not even thinking about a meal or even thinking about having any lunch for the rest of the day which I know is not happening, right? <laughs> right. So now, this is what i like for you to think about. Imagine the church giving you a hot, uh, a warm breakfast, and this is going to happen. It's going to take place on Saturday, Saturday, August 6th. So make sure that you're here at 6 o'clock. Right after that, we're going to go out to the community and share the wonderful news of the gospel with the people around our neighborhood. So make sure that you're here. Now, raise your hand if you're planning not to be here. Hey, there you go. We're going to have a full house. Thank you, everyone. So honest. Remember, we're in church. You're not supposed to lie. So we hope to see you here on August 6th at 9 a.m. 
<laughs> as we ask the ushers to come forward, let's go ahead and ask the Lord for his blessing as we uh, close in a word of prayer and we hear the piano and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for the blessing of being able to be here and be exposed to your word. Lord, allow us to apply it to our lives uh, during this week, Lord. But we also give you all the honor and glory, Lord, with our tithes and offerings, uh, with the faith promise, Lord. And we, we put it back in your hands, Lord, that that it can be used for your glory. Thank you for the blessing, Lord, of uh, being able to participate in this wonderful ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.